Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to you all out there who've come to join us today for this fifth instalment of Theatre Talk Welcome series. Um, today we're joined by a very, very special guest, world-renowned director, choreographer and performer, Mr. Larry Fuller. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and an honour. Big round of applause there from everybody. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us today, Larry. Um, if, if you'd like to start at the beginning and, and work your way um, through um, what you have to say to us, it would be greatly appreciated. We all wait with bated breath to what you have to say mm -hmm. to us. <laughs> okay. Thank you for asking me on, letting me just talk and talk and talk about myself, which of course is my favorite subject. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Usually I like to talk about the people I worked with because they're, they're, they're foibles and, and uh, the way they behaved and their talent, of course. Um, but anyway, I think last time I was on, we, we talked all about Evita. So I won't go into that so much this time, but, uh, I mean, as far as my career goes, I started at 16 in, at the St. Louis Muni Opera in the dancing chorus and did uh, three seasons there. After uh, each year, after a year in school, I'd go to the Muni Opera and dance all summer and then I'd go back to school. But I came to New York uh, when I was 18 and um, people often say to me, oh, weren't you scared? How did you do that? No, I wasn't scared. I was so excited. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't wait to get to New York. And luckily, I had some friends from working at the Muni Opera with um, that I could stay with for a while before, until I found a, a little crummy apartment that I could afford. But um, the first Broadway show I did was West Side Story. I was the original Jet Swing. And um, that was and to uh, uh, do that wonderful choreography. I think it's the, the show I enjoyed performing in because it, they really demanded, it demanded all three categories, acting, singing, dancing. Um, Uh, that none of us should bother to audition for Ballets USA because Jerry wouldn't take any more people out of the company, um, meaning West Side Story. Um, and so one of the people that was going was, uh, uh, oh God, Tommy, Tommy Abbott in the Jets. Uh, guitar was his character name. And um, he didn't have any solo singing or solo dancing. And uh, so I said to, uh, to our dance captain, who was also Jerry's assistant, uh, Jeff, oh God, what's his, I know his name anyway, an old a brain fart there. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, he put me into the show and in two weeks I learned all of the dancing and I was in it for about eight months and then that's when Jerry took these people out to do Ballets USA and uh, so I said to uh, to Jeffrey I I'll I want to go in as guitar I don't want to swing anymore I just want to be on the stage eight times a week and you know really be one of the jets and um, he uh, he said, oh, no, no, I can't do that. It, it's too much work. I can't teach somebody else to swing this show. Oh, no, no, no. And I said, well, if you don't, I'll leave. And um, he didn't, and I left. I went into uh, The Music Man, which was uh, uh, just opened. And there was a dancer named Gary Mentier, who ended up being a very successful producer on television. Laverne and Shirley being one of his shows. Anyway, he was leaving 
and they had a private call for his replacement because they'd only been open like three months or something. And, um, and so I was invited to the call through uh, knowing a friend who was in the show and I got, the, I got it. And so I left Westside and went into Music Man. But the, the, there is one story I need to go back and tell about Westside. Jerry Robbins, as almost anybody who's been in the theater knows, was rather cruel sometimes to people uh, in the company. And he'd take, take you apart in front of the entire company and just kind of leave your guts on the floor. And um, when I was swinging, I would dance for everybody uh, except Tony and Riff. And uh, I don't know who I was on for that night, but Jerry came to see the show and um, give notes after. So uh, I was, I rushed rushed, rushed after so I could be the first down on the stage. We were told to come back as soon as possible uh, for Mr. Robbins. I wanted to be the first to be close to God. And so um, I sat there and then finally everybody got there and he started giving notes and we were all just sitting on the floor on the stage and um, he was pacing back and forth. This is not the moment that he fell in the pit. Um, but, um, cause that's another famous story about him backing into the pit and nobody stopped him. That wasn't this time. <laughs> so um, he was giving notes. Well, I remember once we, towards the middle of it all, uh, Carol Lawrence, who was the original Maria, uh, sat there with her little notebook and her pencil and, uh, he looked at her and he said, fake, fake, fake. And every time he said the word fake, she wrote something down and looked up at him again. <laughs> she'd been, she was like not phased. So she'd been through all this before, I'm sure. And <clears throat> when about 45 minutes went by and I was thinking, and he was thinking, oh, he hasn't, he hasn't given me a note. He must have liked me. Oh, oh I hope so. So Right at the very end, I remember I was sitting downstage left and he looked over at me and he said, you stuck out like that with a sore on it. And that was the end of the note session. We were let go and I stuck out like a sore thumb and I thought I was fired, but I didn't get fired. And um, later on in years, um, Jerry, when I started working with Hal, choreographing uh, some shows with him, Jerry actually uh, recommended me for a couple of jobs. Uh, one of them being to direct and choreograph a musical in London called Marilyn the Musical. And um, it was the first million dollar musical to ever be done in London. And I see that Jim Belcher is, uh, is on here and he was the associate director. So um, we had quite a rough time because you only got 11 performances previews before you had to open. The critics only gave you 11 shows. I don't know why they had that rule there, but they did. And we weren't really quite ready, but we were also kind of sabotaged by our producer, Elliot, um, Yes, Larry, what was Elliot's last name? Film producer. Um, he uh, was an enemy of the British press. Huh? Oh, he was an enemy of the British press, which he told me um, just before our press party, before we opened. And uh, I thought, oh, God, that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> um, Two of the company members had come to me, or maybe three, individually, and apart from anybody else, and said, you know, Larry, it's going around that we're going to be uh, really massacred by the press. I thought, really? I mean, why? They haven't even seen anything. I said, well, uh, there's, there's a lot of kind of political chauvinism going on here now, and they don't like the idea of Americans coming over here and trying out material for Broadway. And I said, oh, okay. So 
you know, you had a good show with really good material and you might have a big success with it. You could have a medium, mediocre show, which this was material wise, God knows, and um, have a big hit if everybody kind of is pulling in the same direction, uh, doing the same show. Anyway, um, they did massacre us. They, they got the, the, uh, the American writers who were unknown and still are. Um, and uh, they really like chopped them off at the knees. And they were very nice to me, I must say. Uh, but um, the show didn't uh, attract the A crowd. So we, it only ran about six months. Um, and it was not the one that uh, was done in New York on Broadway. That It was a totally different show. It was just the same subject. Um, and so you know, I jumped the gun. I went from West Side Story, my first Broadway show, to directing and choreographing my first original musical in London. Well, there was one before that, but... <sighs> That was years before for Guberford and Gross, an original show that I directed and choreographed called Hello Sucker. It was about Texas Guinan, who was a uh, speakeasy nightclub queen in New York. Um, and it certainly didn't have much of a life, but it certainly didn't deserve to. Um, <laughs> I'm bring, blabbering on. Um, didn't you, you didn't you bring um, Funny Girl over to the UK and recreate the staging over here for that? Yeah, well, so I went through, I'll get right to that very quickly. I went through being in uh, West Side Story, The Music Man, Redhead with Gwen Verdon and uh, uh, Richard Kiley, um, Donnie Brook, uh, that was the musical of A Quiet Man, the film A Quiet Man. Uh, Teen, which was Alfred Drake's last Broadway show to do an original role. Uh, and Bravo Giovanni, but another big flop. No Strings, I was in that as a replacement. I replaced Alan Johnson. Um, and then I left that to do the last season of Harry Como with Peter Gennaro. Then uh, the final show that I did uh, on Broadway was um, Funny Girl. And I was a second assistant and dance captain. And unfortunately, Carol Haney passed away three months into the run. And so I inherited the show, so to speak. So I got to do the uh, her work plus a little bit of extra stuff they asked me to do for the first national tour with Marilyn Michaels. And um, then um, went to London to do that production with, uh, with Barbara. Uh, and that was to run only, she only signed for like 14 weeks. So they knew they only had her for that amount of time which was really a, a kind of uh, precipitous for them because um, she found out she was pregnant the day before we opened and uh, she couldn't have done more than 14 weeks. So when she left, the show closed after about two weeks, they had another lady in there, but it didn't work without Miss Tronisan. And so uh, that got me going uh, into, um, choreography and then direction choreography because I got to direct and choreograph the first summer tour of Funny Girl, Goober Ford and Gross, um, the music fairs. Um, and they have they had like eight theaters all around the Northeast coast. And it went on tour through all of their theaters. Um, and of all people to play Fanny Bryce, it was Carol Lawrence and I mean, you would never think of casting Carol as Fanny Bryce, but I knew her to be quite silly and, and cut up and do, you know, like physical comedy and stuff. She, she was really a cut up in rehearsals uh, from working with her on different television shows. So I knew that she had it in her. And, um, 
And she indeed did. Uh, she was very good in the role. She was just physically kind of her own type, if, if a girl isn't pretty. Um, and um, James Mitchell did, uh, did uh, Nicky Arnstein. He was fabulous in that, maybe the best Nicky Arnstein ever. However, uh, and that led me into doing um, other shows for Gruber, Ford and Gross because it was a big, big hit. Um, and when the eight week tour came to an end, they decided to take it around again to like four of the theaters and they recast it because Carol wasn't able to do it. And James Mitchell left without her. He didn't want to do it without her. And so of all people, Barbara Cook, talk about casting, came in to do um, Fanny Bryce and, um, uh, God, what is his name? Can't think of it. He was a, he's a movie star, he was, and probably 15 years younger than her. Oh, come on, Larry, think of his name. The guy that played Nicky Einstein. Anyway, um, George something. Um, she was not so good <laughs> as Sandy Bryce. I remember when we were working uh, on the staging, she had done it evidently somewhere earlier in that summer in a big, you know, amphitheater kind of production. And so she didn't know the original staging. And so I was doing the original staging with her and we were working on uh, I'm the Greatest Star. and. I said to her, I stopped her about something. And I said, no, no, you don't do it that way. Do it this way, whatever. And she said, why? And I said, because it's funnier. It's funny. And she said, funny? You expect me to be funny? I'm just going to, I'm, I'm playing the role. I'm not going to just try to be funny. And I thought, we're in trouble here. The title of the show is Funny Girl. Uh, but. Um, she did okay, she was getting heavy then. So uh, I remember in the rat-a-tat-tat costume, she had um, these uh, jump fruits on, which emphasized her hips even more. I shouldn't be saying this about Barbara, but she looked like two-ton Tessie. And it was difficult in the round to, to hide that problem. Uh, but we got along okay. And uh, God knows she was a talented woman. She just was in the wrong role. And um, then I also did I Do I Do two or three times. Uh, and I did um, one other, I can't think of what it is. Oh, The Music Man, uh, of all things. And uh, they were all quite successful. Uh, but then the, uh, the, uh, uh, Summer stock and civic light opera started drying up. Uh, things were closing and there wasn't very much work. And I had done a couple of uh, Broadway shows, original Broadway shows as choreographer. One of them was called Blood Red Roses and the other one was called That's Entertainment, which was uh, uh, Dietz and Schwartz, um, uh, songbook kind of show was before the film um, and uh, either one of them had been successful. So with everything uh, in stock and City Glide Opera kind of drying up uh, and I certainly wasn't qualified to be at that point offered a, a Broadway, a big Broadway musical, uh, things were financially tight. So I started working as a bartender which I actually enjoyed because uh, it was kind of like an acting lesson. I just decided I, I would be whatever character the person at the bar wanted me to be. And um, I had fun doing it, but that uh, wasn't what I was born to do, so to speak. And then I got a chance to go to Europe and do two productions of West Side Story uh, both in big opera houses, one in Nuremberg and one in Vienna. And um, 
they were also in German. It was the first time they'd had uh, the original West Side Story performed in Germany in German. Uh, and it was a huge, they were both huge successes. And I realized that people in Europe were getting tired of going to see the old operettas, you know, the White Horse Inn and the Flader Mouse and that kind of thing. And they wanted to see musicals, American musicals, American and English. So uh, after I did those two shows, I came back to the States for about a year and a half. And then I got a chance to go back and do another couple of shows, another couple of West Side Stories, a German tour and a, um, uh, a production of West Side at the uh, Graz Opera House in Graz, Austria, which is the second largest uh, city in Austria. At, um, they have a beautiful 1500 seat Baroque opera house there. And so I did West Side and then they asked me to do a Broadway dance evening with their, what they called their ballet. That's their dancers. They had like 20 something dancers signed to the house. So I decided to do something called Jazz and the Dancing Americans, which is a really kind of dance review documentary of how, uh, how um, jazz and social dance uh, intertwined through the decades to, to create various styles of social dance. And uh, it was a huge, huge success. It's like My Fair Lady opened in Graz. And um, so they asked me to come to Vienna and do it at the Theater an der Wien. Now we're getting into more interesting times. Um, I was rehearsing that with their dancers there at the Theater an der Wien. And um, they were doing, the, that theater in Vienna was one of two in the German language countries that did only musicals, no operettas, no opera. And they'd run them uh, eight shows a week, just like Broadway or the West End um, for, they do one show in the fall and one show in the spring. And the show they were doing next was A Little Night Music. And of course, as you probably all know, there are, there are no dancers in A Little Night Music. Um, so they asked me to take their dancers, their 26 dancers and do this uh, Jazz and the Dancing Americans evening uh, when we would perform on Sunday when uh, Little Night Music was dark. And so it just happened that Hal Prince came over um, to put the finishing touches on a Little Night Music. It was staged by George Martin, who was the original uh, production stage manager of the Broadway show. <coughs> and um, he, was a great friend of mine. I'd worked with him before. But anyway, Hal came over and um, we got to kind of know each other because uh, I don't know if you're aware, but in European theaters, there's always a uh, cantina, as they call it, where it's they have food, uh, food, hot, cold, anything you want to drink, including alcohol, which always surprised me. Um, and uh, that people would go there at intermission or at lunchtime during rehearsal or whatever. So I got to talking with Hal, we got along great. So we became quite friendly and um, he left and uh, Night Music opened and Jazz and the Dan Amer Dancing Americans opened and uh, I sent him the reviews because they were good, of course, um, and um, had them translate from German into English. Time marches on a few months. I get uh, a letter from Hal Prince's office asking if I would be the casting director for a production of Candide that was being done in Vienna. Uh, and they had, this producer in Vienna had bought uh, Hal Prince's sets and costumes from the, uh, first revival he did of Candide, the street theater one, where there, was, there were 
wooden walkways in eight different playing areas and so on and so on. And I had seen it once in New York and um, was very impressed by it, I must say. It was, it was a very unusual and appropriate concept for the show. And so uh, I ended up uh, saying, I guess, of course, I'll, I, I'd love to uh, be the casting director. And I was thrilled that he would trust me with that. And um, so I ended up going to London at his request to uh, observe uh, some um, auditions that he was doing there for a London revival of A Little Night Music. And um, so I did, I went and you know I sat in for a couple of days and finally I started uh, saying, uh, well, my, I think this or that about an actor who just auditioned, I figured that if I didn't open my yap, I wouldn't know if we were thinking the same way. So we were, and then out of the blue, he asked me to direct Candy in German, Voltaire. Ooh. So um, I said, yes, I, I'd be honored. Um, I, I, I did say, well, there are a couple of, of, of things that I would have to clear up before I make, before I say absolutely yes. And he said, oh, what's that? And I said, uh, well, George Martin is a very good friend of mine. And uh, he was the original stage manager on, on this version of Candide. So why shouldn't he do it? I don't want to, you know, push him out of the way. And he said, oh, no, no, he can't do it because uh, all the people that did this version of Candide with me will be work at the same time that it's being done in Vienna, will be in New York working on my new musical Pacific Overtures. And I said, oh, well, that's okay. And I said, uh, you know, I can't, um, I can't reproduce your staging exactly because I only saw it once. And uh, I found it a wonderful production, but I mean, I have no way of redoing it exactly as it was. And he said, uh, well, that's okay. I'll just, uh, I'll give you the blocking script and I'd like you to, uh, to, make sure that uh, each scene is in the playing area, there were eight of them, uh, that uh, it originally was. And you know, I'll point out uh, certain things I'd like brought out in, in the playing of the scene. But other than that, you know, just do your own. So I swallowed hard and said, you know, it's like actors who've never ridden, ridden a horse and they're, well, we give you the job if you can ride a horse. Oh, of course I can ride a horse. I am I can jump a horse and so on. You just say yes and leap in. And <coughs> <coughs> of course I had a um, dialogue director on all of these shows that I did that were in German so that they could tell me if something was not exactly what it was in English, when it had been translated, it might mean something else. And other than that, I mean, I, I was fine. And all the actors uh, spoke English or at least understood it because every, everybody in Europe, at least in Germany, um, after World War II, they were required to study English in middle school. And so they had been studying English for years. Um, anyway, that came off. Uh, the night it opened was uh, the night before a little night music, the film was beginning, was to start shooting or rehearsing uh, because it was being done in Vienna and in locations around Vienna. And another phenomenal piece of luck, Patty Birch, who was the original choreographer and was doing the movie, even though there, there wasn't much dance, um, she could only be there for the first two weeks of rehearsal. And then that when we started filming, she had to leave to stage a production of Greece for national tour that she had signed up for. 
uh, and the uh, the film of a little night music had been postponed. It was supposed to start in be done out of Munich, and then through circumstances, it ended up being in Vienna instead. And it didn't start until like two or three months after it was originally supposed to. So Patty had to leave after um, two weeks. And I stayed on and helped put her work on the film and do a couple of little things here and there. Um, and uh, that established a, a work relationship between Hal and myself. And um, so then the, mu the movie was over. Of course, I was in seventh heaven doing this movie with uh, Hal Prince and Elizabeth Taylor and, and Hermione Gingold and Diana Rigg and making more money than I'd ever made in my life. And uh, <clears throat> then it was over and they went away. And I continued with my career in Austria and Germany. I was doing quite well and I was going to stay there um, uh, and create a uh, musical theater rep company uh, based in Munich was my idea and um, do, you know, like uh, Theater Andavine, um, musicals, American or British uh, in German, in Germany. And then eventually get original musicals written by Germans. Um, but that didn't happen because suddenly I got a phone call and it was Hal Prince saying, um, I would like you to choreograph my new musical on the 20th century. Well, I almost dropped the phone, but I said, well, I'm, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> and so I got to do on the 20th century and I moved back to New York and then one show led to another, led to another. Um, as in on the 20th century, Evita. Um, what was after that? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah, I'm having an old brain fart. <laughs> Sweeney right <laughs> after you? It's Sweeney and then Marilyn, was it? No, no, no. That wasn't until after I'd, after I'd done five shows with Hal. Um, Sweeney was next, thank you. Um, yeah. and, then, um, and then a show called A Doll's Life, um, which I called A Doll Life, but you know. Uh, and, um, and then the very end was Merrily We Roll Along. And now the last two were not successful. Uh, so then uh, I got this uh, offer to go to London and do Marilyn because of Jerry Robbins. Um, and um, so that was my first big full out musical to direct and choreograph. And I already told you about that. And then I came back to the States trying to remember which was which now. Then I did, uh, oh, I did different Evita companies. Um, and um, then I went back to London in 1986 and did a show called Time, which was a big uh, sci-fi musical. And uh, God, it cost so much money, it was ridiculous. And uh, there was a big star in it, at least big in England and Europe. Um, and um, again, I'm blanking about a name. Cliff um, Richard. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was a big pop star, had been for years, kind of the British version of Pat Boone. It was all kind of very clean rock and roll. And um, He'd never done a West, a West End show. He'd never done any book musical. Well, he wasn't an actor uh, in any sense of the word, but um, the score was really good. The book was Nick. And uh, I was uh, promised that we'd get a, a new book writer in and that never happened. And um, so I took the show on the value of the score and Cliff Richards. Um, 
but Cliff, I remember at one point I, I had given him as much as I could by talking to him. So he was, he would go dead uh, in a scene when he wasn't talking. It's like he didn't know what to do in his head when some other actor was talking. And so I, I resorted to the last thing I could think of and I followed him around during the scene and I would whisper in his ear what he was, what his character was thinking while the other characters talked. <laughs> I, that way I got him into a groove that he was uh, rather, he was convincing. Um, anyway, it was a huge success because of him. And the minute he left, which was a year later, um, he was replaced by David... David Cassidy. Cassidy, thank you. <laughs> and he ran in it for six months. And it, it did okay, it did fine, because David Cassidy was well known in England. Um, and then David Cassidy left and uh, David Ian, who was David Cassidy's understudy and has since become quite a successful producer in England, um, he took over. And uh, he was the best of the three because he was cast because of his talent and his type for the role. The other two were cast because they were stars. And um, so, Unfortunately, his name and the show did not sell. So it closed after, well, I think it ran two years. Never got to New York, thank God, because it, it was quite a spectacle visually, but material was embarrassing at times. Um, oh, that was the show also. Laurence Olivier was a character in it, and, but he was on film, so I never even met him. Uh, they did all of his filmed things uh, before I was hired. Uh, and um, he played a character named Akash. He was the, uh, the Wizard of Oz of uh, the universe. And um, they filmed just his face. And they had a 13 foot high reproduction of his face and it, it was on a, uh, like a huge erector set metal arm that was bolted into the back wall of the theater. And it would come towards you and the film would come, go onto his face. And it looked like it was his face floating in air. Um, but uh, you couldn't cut any of it because they were all one take. So, and he wasn't about to come back and redo it. Um, so the problem was that the, uh, the film, the projector uh, was on the balcony rail and um, it didn't, this particular film technique had ever been done at such a distance and in such a large image. Um, so, I remember the day that uh, this was all uh, Dave Clark of the old Dave Clark Five was the producer and the sole producer of this. And this was his baby. He had come up with this. And he had worked with uh, Olivier during the filming. And they had put Olivier in a ball paint and his head was uh, resting in a black velour uh, well, mold the back of his head so that he couldn't move his head because it's very facial when he acts and so on. So he was told, do not move your head. Try to not move any part of your face but your mouth because, uh, because the mask, the 13 foot mask had blank eyes and a blank mouth. And um, his nose, had to be exactly on the tip of his nose or the picture would smear. Well, what happened was we went in to see this the first day it was installed and uh, 
we started, sat down and, and they cued the film to start. Well, more, not more than maybe 10 or 15 seconds into the film. Suddenly one side of his face going like this. And uh, it's because the image on film had slipped slightly off the tip of his, like the tip of the image of his nose was supposed to be right on it. But he evidently had imperceivably moved. And so they had to take that 13 foot mask off of the big metal arm, put a, um, moving joint, I don't know how else to explain it, uh, behind the mask where the mask joined the, arm, the metal arm so that they could move the mask to match the film. That meant that they had to go through the entire film after it was finally, the apparatus was made and computerize so that the mask would move when it had to, to stay from uh, in sync with the picture. And that little deal cost something like 2 million pounds to make that work. It was impressive, but uh, I mean, the, it caught, the show cost 4 million and, um, pounds. And that was by far the most expensive show that had ever been done in London. Um, but as I said, it was a spectacle to see. Uh, I won't go into what the rest of the effects were, but they were quite amazing. Um, so let's see. God almighty, I have jammered and jammered. Um, <laughs> it's fine. You carry on, Larry. As long as you want to keep going, you keep going. <laughs> um, so after that, the last big thing I did was uh, On Your Toes in, um, in Stuttgart, Germany with the Stuttgart Ballet. The Stuttgart Ballet is one of the most prominent ballets in the world, or it, certainly it was then. Um, and the stars of the Stuttgart Ballet were Marcia Haide and um, uh, um, Richard Cragen. And uh, a, a musical, American musical director, conductor, arranger, whatever he did, did dance arrangements for me. He conducted the orchestra, he did everything. Um, and Charles Axton, better known as Charlie, um, he and I went to, because we had done about three or four productions of American musicals in German opera houses and they were all quite successful so we'd kind of gotten a name in the country and we went to Marcia Haide in Stuttgart. Uh, she was not only the star of the ballet, she was also the uh, executive director of the company and um, so we went to her with the idea, well she jumped right on it. I mean she loved the idea that she'd get to play that role. Uh, since Makarova had been such a big success in the revival in New York and, uh, and Richard was to play the uh, professor uh, who had come from a vaudeville family and uh, was mainly a tap dancer. And Richard had never tap danced, but <laughs> he was an amazing student. I mean, bang, he took to it like, flies to water, I don't know, he just really took to it. And um, so we did that, rehearsed for a long time. We used everybody in the company, all the dancers who were from various countries um, and the ones that had to have dialogue. Um, we were originally gonna do it, Wish I know that sounds weird, but that was, a thing they were doing. Um, and then we decided because there were so many nationalities in the company uh, that we'd rather have uh, accent, English with accents than bad German. So um, we did it in English. And to my amazement, the audience here, that thing again about everybody speaking English, they got all the jokes, all the double entendres and all that stuff. They understood everything. 
and it was huge success. Again, like My Fair Lady opened in Stuttgart and um, it, it ran four seasons, in, not every night, they did it in repertory uh, with other ballets. Um, and then we went on tour to Japan in 1994. It was done originally in 1990. Uh, because the Japanese wanted the Stuttgart Ballet, which had been coming there for years, but they didn't want the old ballets. All they wanted was On Your Toes. So we did four weeks of On Your Toes in Japan. Um, and by that time, I was kind of fizzling out, so to speak. Um, there were other companies, certainly of the Vita National Tours and things that were supposed to come into New York. There were a couple of those. Um, one of them in 1998, we reproduced the entire original set and costumes and uh, went on tour for about a year. And it was supposed to come into New York in the fall of 1999. Um, which would have been 20 years exactly to when it opened on Broadway. And uh, the producer was Robert Stigwood, it was his money. He was the original producer. Um, and uh, a general manager named Manny Kleditis uh, was acting producer in New York. We never even saw Stigwood, but um, so we went out for a year and when it came time to come into New York, I was told we couldn't come in. And I said, why, why, why? We've done all this, why wouldn't? Well, the writers, Andrew and Tim, Andrew Lagweber and Tim Rice uh, said they didn't want it to come in as long as Stigwood's name was on it. And his, uh, rights to the, as a producer, expired at midnight on December 31st of 1999. And we were supposed to come in in September. And uh, Hal said, well, we can't do it. We can't do it without the writers. If they object, I'm not gonna do it. And so we didn't come in and then, um, Following that in 2005, four or five, five, I think, uh, we mounted another production, um, which was also intended to come into New York. It was booked for a little over a year on the road. And Hal kept trying to get them, them being the writers, Andrew and Tim, to give us permission to bring it in. And uh, they wouldn't, they just kept avoiding it. And then we found out after we closed that they had this new uh, production that directed by a, a gentleman from opera, I can't remember his name right now, and uh, choreographed by an American choreographer, <sighs> brain fart. Um, and- Was uh, that Wolfgang Bosch? Was that the one? Hmm? Was that Wolfgang Bosch? Was that the, the German? No, 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 no. Wolfgang Bosch did it all over Europe, okay. but he never Carry did on. it. <laughs> yeah, I did a company for him. Oh, God, what a man. Anyway, um, we, we wanted to come in and then they wouldn't give us permission. And then we found out that Andrew and Tim had planned this new revival with a different director, a different choreographer, everything completely different, nothing from the original. And uh, it didn't Michael work Grandage. very well. Thank you. Michael Grandage, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so anyway, that was the end of bringing Avita into New York. Uh, and I think I have talked long enough. <laughs> Come on. Where is Larry Blank? Where the hell is he? He's Larry, oh, we've got Larry here for you. I'll just unmute here? him for you. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yeah. there he is. Hi, Larry. Hello, everybody. I can't see him, but that's okay. Hi, Larry. Hello, hello. Of course, most of you probably know who Larry Blank is. 
but uh, he was among other many, many, many things that he's done to great acclaim, both in this country and others. Um, the original musical director of the first Los Angeles company of Evita, which opened at the Schubert Theater in January of 1980. And uh, so I thought it would be fun to have him on and we'd talk a little bit. Well, Larry, it's so great to hear everything uh, you've, you've been talking about. I didn't know a lot of it, even though we've talked many times over the years. But, um, and also I wanted to mention when you were talking about Barbara Cook, the actor was George Hamilton. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I had to look it up. I remember George too, but I couldn't remember the Hamilton part. Yeah, uh, he was, I thought at that time, Larry, I thought, you know, here we got Barbara Cook, who's a Broadway, legitimate Broadway star, good actress, but, and I hadn't even started working with her on it or anything. And we got George Hamilton, this glamour boy movie star who's 15 years younger than she is, at least. And I thought, oh God, he's going to be a pain in the ass. But, and it turned out to be the other way around. <laughs> he was terrific. He was so good. Anyway. What was fascinating to me, you talk about your career, you know, I know you, you make light of it because it was what you were doing, but you were working for every great choreographer there was, Jerry Robbins, Anna White, and how many shows did you do with Jack Cole? Oh, I did Jack's original, uh, the uh, nightclub act that he did in the 40s and 50s. I did it with him. It was the last time he ever performed uh, in Las Vegas at the Dunes somewhere around 1960, 61, something like that. Uh, and that's when I met George and Ethel Martin, who were just uh, ending off dancing and becoming choreographers in their own right. And I was really, my career was just on its not total beginnings. I'd done three Broadway shows, but um, uh, Jack taught me how to dance again. I thought I could dance pretty damn good, but he just took it apart and put it back together in a much better way. And uh, even though he was uh, aggravating as hell to work for sometimes, a um, couple of fun stories about him. Uh, we, were, we were rehearsing in Los Angeles for the Dunes uh, opening. And the three numbers we were going to do were the Kismet, opening and the uh, Sing Sing Sing, which was pretty well known as the first real jazz dance number to uh, Benny Goodman's original recording of Sing Sing Sing. And then um, uh, the Afro-Cuban closing, which he, uh, he took at Catherine Dunham's primitive dance technique and made it into uh, something of his own. Anyway, uh, we were doing the Kismet opening and in Kismet in this East Indian jazz dance thing that he did, you know, you had like, you had your, your hands were doing one thing and your head was doing another and your feet was doing something else. I mean, because there, there were all different rhythms and there was this one step where he, uh, it was, you had to slide your feet along the floor, kind of, kind of like, uh, 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 cross-country skiing and you had to hold your hand with that one finger up and not the middle one <laughs> and uh, and push your arms back and forth as you were sliding your feet along the floor and carrying your body in a certain way and he looked at me one day in rehearsals and he stopped and he said you look like Ann Miller trying to do a comeback in house shoes. <laughs> I got so hysterical. I could see in his head, I could see what he was thinking. It was like with these, her Ann Miller in big pink kind of fluffy high heel house shoes, so to speak, trying to keep them on. <laughs> I got hysterical. And then he smiled, he stepped back and he smiled. And he never, ever bothered me again. I mean, certainly he corrected me, but he never got bitchy with me. And uh, because he, he understood that I, I dug what was going on in his head. And um, there were a couple of other stories, but 
anyway, from from um, Larry, from when I was uh, working with him at the Dunes, when that closed, um, he um, he asked me to do a Broadway show that he was about to do called Donnybrook, and uh, I did it. We rehearsed, went out of town, came back opened at the what was, what was then the 46th Street Theater, where Hamilton is now. And um, play, I think we ran for six weeks, six or eight weeks. Uh, then there was another show he was going to do very shortly thereafter uh, called Keen with uh, Alfred Drake, as I said. It's about a, a, a British classical actor in London of the late 1700s. And um, so we, same process, we rehearsed for, I don't know, four or five weeks, we went out of town and we came back in and we opened at the Broadway and ran six weeks. And then um, I did, um, I think that was when I did, uh, um, Bravo Giovanni with Carol Haney. Anyway, that was another six weeker. Uh, and uh, help me, Larry. Well, I was, I was gonna mention Carol Haney next because she did so much work with her. Um, but but uh, I mean, right away we're talking Jerry Robbins, Jack Cole and Carol Haney, you know, they weren't exactly, you know. And Peter Gennaro. And Peter Gennaro. <laughs> and uh, so talk a little bit about Carol Haney because I know you did two shows with it, right? Uh, yes, I did uh, Bravo Giovanni, which I've already said was a flop and funny girl. But um, because Carol was a Jack Cole dancer as well uh, as Gwen Verdon and uh, uh, Matt Maddox and George and Ethel Martin and B, I uh, can't think of her last name right now. Anyway, um, if you're, worked with Jack for a while. I mean, other, you could tell that you were trained by him. You could just tell the way people moved. Uh, and um, so Carol obviously dug me because I had that technique in my body and, um, and uh, hired me for uh, Bravo Giovanni. And, um, and then I did some other work for her. I did um, a big Oldsmobile Industrial which was based on the show Bells Are Ringing, starring Gretchen Letter. And um, those were the days we did those big car shows. I'm curious you about something. Um, mm -hmm. so forgive me for interrupting, but- uh, No, go ahead. Uh, talking about West Side Story, because much later on you did all that work with Hal Prince. Did you have any relationship with Hal from West Side Story since he was one of the producers? Because you, you didn't mention no. that. In your discussion? Well, that's because I didn't really have one. I mean, a, a, any kind of real like relationship at all. I, I think I met him once, maybe. I remember him being backstage at Westside a couple of times. Um, but no, I didn't really know how until Vienna. I couldn't oh. get my foot in the door in New York. I tried, but, and he'd always politely say, no, I have a choreographer, thank you. <laughs> then you never know where, when things are going to happen. I was just thinking about, you probably remember this, but I, I did some work on Prince of Broadway as one of the orchestrators, and we hung out a bit at the party. And, and I remember being at this party and everybody who was everybody from 1955 to 1975 and beyond were in that room, just a little mm -hmm. bit older. <laughs> and, and Patty Birch was sitting there and Joel Gray was there and Charles Strauss and it was just an amazing group of people all to celebrate how and uh, I, I don't think anyone realizes how important they do realize but how important how Prince was to the evolution of all of us Absolutely. in terms of employment and, and just Absolutely. bringing musical theater forward I know when Hal first uh introduced me to the score uh, of Evita. Uh, we were 
we were working on the movie of night music in, in Vienna. And um, he said, you know, I got, I got these cassettes from the guys that wrote Jesus Christ Superstar. And they've written this uh, score for a musical about Ava Peron. And I thought, I think I remember who that is from little kid and, you know, like newsreels or something. <clears throat> and he said, I want you to listen to it and tell me what you think. So I did, and never dreaming I'd ever be connected with it. Um, and I said to him, I like it, I do, but it's very unusual. And it's not something that most musical theater directors could do well. It would take someone with a very special kind of point of view. And I think you'd do it extremely well if, if you do it. So he said, oh, thank you. That was the end of that until um, we were working on uh, starting to work on um, on the 20th century. And then I found out he was going to do it. And he asked me if I'd like to do it with him. Wow. Let me compliment hey. you now. Because, <laughs> because let, let me help everybody. I, I was around for 20th century because my ex was in it. But um, uh, but but I want to tell everybody that Avita has changed so much over the years and it's been restaged a million times. And it's not the Avita that you, you and Hal did originally anymore. And your contribution to the original success of that was monumental as it was to 20th century. So everybody should know that and applaud you for it because uh, everybody you. feels that way. Thank and, you. And, and I was so honored to be part of when we became friends and acquainted with one another on Avita. It, it was so much fun to do. And it was because it was the staging that made it and the, and the movement on the stage. And I know Hal had the concept, but you realized it for him. Well, yeah, he had the concept for sure, uh, life in the public arena, but and the difference being between that and the private life. Um, but um, we went through that show scene by scene by scene. I call it a, a, a documentary review depicting somebody's life um, in a series of musical numbers. And we went through that script number by number by number by number to try to clearly uh, decide how each segment was going to be done because we were doing it in a um, kind of metaphoric, poetic, visual way so that the, the, uh, the staging would tell more of the story that you didn't get from just the lyrics um, about the various characters' attitudes, of course. Um, so we had to we had to do long sessions of thinking, will that work, will that work, will that work? I remember once when Hal said, uh, musical chairs, I said, and then he said, oh, no, no, no. And I said, wait a minute, what did you say musical chairs? And he said, well, you know, for the, uh, the generals thing, uh, art of the possible. Uh, it probably wouldn't work. I said, Hal, that's great. You've got to do that. It's wonderful. It's, it's little boys playing a child's game at how they were going to get to the top of the political positions in a country. I think that's a great idea. So he didn't do it, but he did it with rocking chairs, which made it musical, uh, you know, because you, you could move the chairs. And um, so he staged it and I kind of musicalized it. Uh, and we, we went along that way, kind of mm -hmm. bouncing off each other. Well, that was one of the most brilliant uh, moments in the show. And I remember uh, being in the rehearsal room with you at, in the, at the um, church on Franklin Avenue. The Methodist Church, yes. The Methodist yes. Church, yes. <laughs> and, and I remember how, I mean, about the only time he ever gave me a note, which was we were at the rehearsal, and he came over to me and said, make sure you really cut off the orchestra when the chairs stop and all that. And he was just said, make it very sudden and abrupt so everybody knows what we're doing. And so and it was a great moment in the show. Yeah, it was, it was. And it was, uh, it was one of many, I have to say. <laughs> 
One wow. of Mary Larry. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, yeah, the staging of that show was uh, about 50-50. But Hal was so great to collaborate with um, because, uh, you know, you, you, as I said, we'd have those talks and then I would go into my room with whoever I was working with and he'd go into his and uh, of course, sometimes we'd work the same room, but um, like the opening we put together, together, uh, we kind of, he'd start blocking it and then I'd jump in and you know, say, well, well, why don't we do this or let's do that? And um, it, it just blended very well. And um, he would come in at the end of a day or the end of a thing where I was working on something and that was going to be the end of that for the day. And he'd come in and, and if it was ready to be looked at, uh, he would come in and look at it and then he would say, where he didn't understand what was going on. You know, I could say, okay, well, I get that and I get that, but what's going on over there? Why, what are you trying to say? And maybe you could, you know, make it clearer. And so like, uh, what's New Buenos Aires, which is an eight minute number uh, with everybody in the company and, uh, it's really like a ballet in, in the way that uh, I tried to tell the story with physical images and dance, like exaggerated body language. And um, he would come in and he'd you know, do that and then I'd work on it and then he'd come in and look again and he'd say, yeah, well, not quite, try again. And um, it, it, it wasn't you know like you've done bad, he just was, collaborating with you and it didn't make you feel like he didn't like what you were doing um and he would allow me to do that with him he'd say come on i want you to look at this and tell me what you think so it really was a collaboration and it was a, a, a wonderful one and we had no idea what the hell we had because nobody had ever done anything like that so it was it was very welcoming to, to everybody you know, in that collaborative way. And I remember that most distinctly from, from my experiences. But I just recalled something which you might recall too, which was the very first, we were at the Schubert in LA for the tech rehearsal. And uh, Hal gave his usual speech and, you know, Ruthie was there and it was, it was a big technical show. And I think I had even the orchestra in the pit for the tech rehearsals, it, there was a lot of money being spent. And I remember the set was very stark and there were light bulbs all along the top. And then the set came down a little bit. And the very first time the set came down, I think George Martin was calling it and every yes, one of the light, light bulbs smashed and hit the ground. And Hal turned around without flinching and said, well, for tomorrow's rehearsal, we'll start at this moment. <laughs> and he just <laughs> ended it right then and there. That was the end of the evening. <laughs> It was glass all over the stage, but oh, wow. but he was so amazing about it. He didn't even flinch. It was like that was the end of the day. <laughs> Reminds me of when the bridge fell in Sweeney Todd during a preview. There's a five thousand pound bridge on uh, like bicycle, heavy bicycle chains, and suddenly you heard Bip! and this thing came Brrr! and bam and it hit the floor. It was during nothing. It was during uh, City on Fire, and thank God nobody was under it. But that stopped the show. That's for sure. Right. Uh, sorry <laughs> to, sorry told to, me uh, sorry. <laughs> carry on. <laughs> no, just quickly. Walter Charles told me that story as well. Who's also in the cast, and he said the next day, Hal came in with a construction helmet and said, "Everything's okay. If any of you want to get on it, I won't." But. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> yeah equity was at that meeting too believe me <laughs> um larry we've got some i don't know we've got a question or uh somebody else who wants to share a memory with you julie thomas um i think she i've just um julie do you want to unmute yourself hi can you hear me we can hear you julie hi everyone just Fun I've come to the party late, sorry, because I've been having a party here. <laughs> so got rid of everybody and here I am. And it's so wonderful to, to, to 
see you and hear you, Larry. It's, I can't believe it's 43 years since I, mm -hmm. I was just one of the happiest girl dancers in London <laughs> when you gave me that opportunity um, to, to dance for you in the West End. And it, it was just incredible. And I, um, I just want to just hang on to those incredible moments when, when we were as dancers on that, in that rehearsal room, we were hanging on your every step. But um, now I've, as, as I've gone into choreography myself, because I still teach, I just wondered, I wasn't going to ask you a question, but um, the style was so fabulous, so Latino, so amazing. And was it, was it something that you had actually already planted? You'd already choreographed it, or did you more or less have the seed and then you just improvised on in the rehearsal room with us? I'm trying to remember because it was a long time ago. It but. sure was. Um, and I remember how cold those damn rehearsal rooms were in London. Yes! <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, there was a bit of both. I did do uh, pre-production with my assistant in the Papworth and I had it all mapped out more or less. The music was laid out. I didn't have every single detail filled in by any means. But I had the majority of it done. Now, as far as the dance style, that was truly just Jack Cole jazz with a Spanish, yeah. uh, you know, hands and arms, the Spanish yeah. port of bra. Yeah. Put I've on been top trying of to it. remember some of the choreo because I must be totally honest with you, Larry. I have never wanted to go and see any other production in 43 years. I just couldn't, it would break my heart to see yeah. any, any of the, anybody else's choreography but yours, because I just absolutely adored everything you gave to us. I mean, I always wanted to be in West, West Side Story, but for me, this was... Um, well, it was. It's, well, it was. It was, it was just like, a bit, I mean, I always wanted to play nobody. Is it nobody? The girl? The anybody. Anybody. Anybody, yeah. I always wanted to play her, but I never got that role. But then I got to be in Evita, the original cast. And this was like, wow, I, this is like being a West Side Story. This is almost like being, so it was just such a thrill. Uh, and to do that amazing choreo. Um, and here I am, I find myself at the age of 63. I'm now teaching Zumba. Zumba gold for the golden oldies. So I, <laughs> all my all my wonderful um, attendees are 60, 70, 83. My mom sees me on Zoom twice a week. Uh, she's 83. I still do this. And, and I just think, my God, it's just the, so, it's like I'm, and I'm dancing two versions of, you know, Rainbow High and whatever. I'm still bringing mm -hmm. it back. And it's just amazing that, that it's still living in me, this incredible, experience that I had so I just um I just think it was just amazing your your work and um everything you did the research you must have done for it all so thank you and and the history lesson of course all a lot of us uh in that original cast I'm speaking for myself and I know I'm speaking for quite a few of us um we didn't know much about Ava Perron and it was a history lesson it was an incredible history lesson for us um we're not close to America like you, uh, uh, South America um so being in England it was like wow this was all going on and we didn't know so it's incredible for me a girl who had, didn't have much education it was a history lesson it was everything it was everything um, well, um the history lesson that's for sure we did a lot of research. Yeah. But we never went to uh, yes. we never went to Argentina because Hal oh, wow. was advised by the State Department at that time. The Perones were still very, very popular there. And um, uh, Hal was advised by the State Department not to go to oh. Argentina uh, to do research because at that time, even the white concept album that first came out was not, was illegal. You could even have it in the country. And um, that's had a hot 
topic it was. And they were, sh they were sure that if he went, that when we went through customs, uh, they would know why he was there. So they Incredible. found, they said they didn't think it was really safe. So we didn't go. So I, I, after 43 <clears throat> years, I still have a big urge to go to Buenos Aires, you know, and, and just go there. Me too, I've oh. never been. Oh, you've never been? Let's oh, give somebody no. else a chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Julie, thanks for sharing your Thank memories. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Jackie wants to uh, say to, a few words to you, Larry. Um, okay, Jackie, do you want to, Jackie, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, uh, there she's There you go, Jackie. Oh, no, you've, 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 you've yeah. muted yourself again. You need to unmute yourself, Jackie. Come on, Jackie, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> oh, I think Jackie's frozen. I think she is. We'll come back to Jackie. <laughs> Are you with us, Jackie? I think I did. No. Oh, oh yes, here I she am. is. Here she is. Hello, oh. Jackie. Hello. So, Larry, I'd just like to say, I know that the um, critics weren't very kind to Marilyn, but the audiences loved it. And I, I saw it at least once a week while she oh. goes doing it. <laughs> and uh, as you can see from my little pictures behind me, um, but yes. I would just like to say, I would really appreciate it if at some time we can arrange a little meeting because I would love you to sign my poster. Oh, my internet is a little bit spotty, but I have a signed poster by all the cast and you're the only one missing. Where are you in the world? I'm in Los Angeles. Oh. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I'm in uh, Palm so Springs. So not very far from you. No, yeah. you're not. Yeah, I'm so sure. I would love that at some point. I, have, uh, I haven't been in LA for quite a while. You know, the pandemic and all that. Well, I have friends in Palm so, Springs. I'm going to be visiting soon. <laughs> oh, well, bring the poster if you can. We'll do it I would then. love to. Thank you. Jackie is also too shy to tell you, but she was very well acquainted with Stephanie Lawrence uh, through all the years that she was working in the West End and uh, uh, worked with her, I believe, uh, as a, an assistant, right, Jackie? I did, I did do her fan mail for her, yes. But and, she was and, a very, very good friend of mine. And I actually met her at the stage door of Marilyn. Um, and my oldest daughter is named after her. <laughs> Ah, well, she was quite a talent. It's too bad. I would she... love it if you'd like to share some memories of working with her, because I know you worked with her on Evita and Marilyn and Time. Well, actually, uh, I did not work with her on Evita. Somebody else put her in. I saw her do it, but I didn't put her in the show. Um, <clears throat> and um, Marilyn, we worked together, and she was an amazing Marilyn. She was like, she channeled that woman. She didn't do an impersonation, which I certainly never wanted anyway. Uh, and Jim and I were, we really had a good time working with her, I think. I certainly did. Um, and uh, she was an American, an amazing Marilyn. Had the show, show gone on and been reproduced uh, in various er parts of the world, it would have been very difficult to find the woman to play that part. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, what else do you want to know? Or um, we Jackie, well, you wanted to know. Larry, where are you, Larry? <laughs> I did. I'm right here. <laughs> um, I think was, um, somebody wanted to know a little bit more about Mer the experience of working on Merrily We Go Along, because um, you know that was one of the shows that didn't quite go to, you know, wasn't as successful as it as it as it ought to have been, or. Um, how was, how was working on that, Larry? Well, I came into Marilee during previews. Ron Field was the original choreographer. Um, and um, I saw the show at what they called the Gypsy Run-Through. You know, they do a run-through for people in the business before they start previews. Um, 
I saw that and I realized they were in deep shit. But um, uh, Ron's work, in, I mean, Ron was so talented. God, he was a terrifically talented man. And he just took the wrong angle uh, for the show because at least with the cast, he didn't have real dancers. I mean, when I took it over, I found three people in the company that actually had dance training and could do something that's technically uh, a little more difficult. And um, he, he, he tried to make them dance. I mean, he gave them hard stuff to do and they looked bad doing it and, because they weren't really capable of it. And uh, it wasn't for a point. I mean, there wasn't a reason why they were supposed to look bad. They just did. And um, he evidently had uh, some uh, behavioral problems. I don't know, he was sick by then and he certainly probably knew it, um, meaning AIDS. Um, and um, so when, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, Hal's daughter, uh, 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 can't think of her name. Daisy. Anyway. She was in it. Thank you, God. Um, Daisy Prince, she was in it. And um, she came home evidently at least two different evenings uh, from rehearsals in tears because of the way Ron had treated them. And what his work wasn't working. So Hal decided to let him go. Now for Hal to fire somebody must have been a terrible dilemma for him because he always said he couldn't fire anyone because he, he felt so bad about it. But he fired him. And uh, <clears throat> then he, they got a hold of me and said, uh, Would you come in and take a look at the show and see if you think you can help us out? So I did, and we did. And I just said, I'm going to need more time because uh, they were like a week and a half into three weeks of previews which left very little time because with matinees, he couldn't rehearse on a matinee day. So I said, uh, I need some more time. And he said, okay, we'll extend the uh, previews and, and until we're ready. And uh, I went in every day and uh, I knew what number I was going to do. It was like being back in summer stock in a way because you just pick the number and do it and then move on, put it in that night and go on. And um, so I was, I did redid almost every, well, all, all the big numbers I redid and, and some of the other ones as well. Uh, even the crossovers uh, depicting what year we were in. Anyway, except for the uh, uh, Frankly Frank review in the second act, which was such a wonderful piece of writing. Again, Mr. Sondheim. Uh, Anyway, I would be in the lounge uh, maybe an hour, an hour and a half before rehearsal started and then working over the music with the uh, dance arranger and musical director. And um, uh, Hal would quite often be there and Steve as well. To, so they wanted to know what I was gonna do that day. And so I would say this, that, this, that. We got to... Um, now you know, which is the end of act one. <clears throat> and everybody is spouting off like little couplets, a couple of lines here, four lines there, out of the group uh, at Frank, uh, the principal story man, and uh, telling him, oh, well, you know, drop your dimple, now you know, and life is terrible. Uh, but keep going and so on. Just little pieces of advice, so to speak. And I, <clears throat> I said to Steve, you know, those, those two lines right here, I'd like to put, give them to somebody on the other side of the stage because something important is going to happen over there right after and I want to take the focus over there. And he said, uh, oh, no, you can't do that. I said, oh, well, why? And he said, because it's not their rhyme scheme. I said, 
Do you mean to tell me that every single person on that stage has their own rhyme scheme? And he said, well, yes, of course. And I looked at Hal and I said, did you know that? And he looked at me like, no, <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> so I said, okay, Steve, I'll find another way. And I did. But uh, the reason that everybody had their own rhyme scheme evidently was because originally when they started rehearsals, everybody had a specific character. And so they had to cut a lot of individual lines from other characters that did not contribute to the story anymore. So they, they still ended up with their rhyme scheme, but very few lines. <laughs> and uh, we opened and I mean, Steve and Hal were all but sure that, that we were gonna get blasted. You know, I remember Hal saying, you know, if Tommy Toon did this show, They'd love it. <laughs> he just said, like, we are, we're too far uh, gone now. They're ready to give it to us. And they certainly did. I so saw I both versions of it. Uh, I, was, I was kicking around New York and I saw it early in previews and I saw it again after you took it over. And, and as you know, it was unfortunately a troubled show just because of the rhyme schemes alone. But yes. Uh, but, but you did solve a lot of the issues in terms of focus of staging, which made it, it, it having seen both versions, it made it a lot better. But it's it's well, wonderful now hearing the recording because we can hear all the rhyme schemes <laughs> that you and Hal didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know I couldn't, I was so emotionally fraught when that show opened and wasn't successful because I had really put my heart and soul into it. And um uh, I hadn't listened to the cast album for like until about two months after it opened or after it closed, I should say. And then one day I decided, okay, I'm gonna listen to it. And I was astounded at what phenomenal, how phenomenal that score is. I mean, that's Steve's last, so to speak, musical comedy or musical theater, whatever you wanna call it, tradition, more or less, traditional musical score because after that then there was uh, Sunday in the Park and Into the Woods and so on which were uh, uh, more abstract um, and uh, I just couldn't get over how good it was and because when working on it I you know it's number by number how am I going to make this one work and, uh, well I saw I really got far I, I saw Hello okay. Sucker so Oh. <laughs> you're, you're Which we talked about. And I know that. <laughs> oh, did you see it with Martha Ray? I did. I did. And it was totally, I mean, we didn't know each other at the time. I just happened to be somewhere in Massachusetts at the theater it was playing at, and I bought a ticket. So. Well, you must have been a child. <laughs> I was. I was very young. <laughs> But I remembered that you had done it, and uh, it, it, it was, uh, the, the, as you said, Texas kind of, so it was mildly entertaining, and she was a lot of fun. And of mm -hmm. course, it was in the round. I, I don't remember much else about the cast. No, well, you wouldn't. <laughs> no. uh, just moving on, back, um, I have a quick question for you, uh, Larry. Um, moving forward to, to time again. Um, you worked alongside Arlene Phillips um, on that show and I saw it a couple of times and I was just completely blown away by it, um, you know, the effects and the dancing was just excellent. And, you know, like, like you mentioned, the book could have been a bit better, but as, a, as an overall unique show, um, it was, you know, to a young teenager, it was absolutely fantastic. And I, I just have to ask you, um, you know, was it, it must have been rather tricky um, choreographing and, and staging the numbers around all those massive set pieces. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, I was just going, I was just wondering um, if you could tell me anything more about that process as, uh, as, you, were, as you were working on the show. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there were two dance styles in the show. <coughs> Sorry. 
There were two dance styles in the show. One was pop lock, and that was the uh, robots, which I did not very well because I didn't really know a lot about pop lock. Um, and then Arlene Phillips did the the other kind of the uh, the outer space pirate gang, and and she could really just do more or less regular dancing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And it was difficult because of the uh, the surface of the stage was, uh, as you probably remember, but nobody else would know here unless they've seen it. It was a 30 foot diameter circle that sat on like a saucer on one of its edges, straight up behind, mm -hmm. uh, sitting directly in front of that mask, that 13 foot mask of, uh, uh, of Lawrence oh, Olivier, yeah. So Lawrence <laughs> Olivier, yes. And um, it came forward, and then it was it was pinned on e either side, stage right and stage left, and it was tracked in the air, and then it turned so that it was then like the saucer's edge was at the audience, and it landed on the stage. Um, I remember it moved, it moved really quickly, didn't it? It, it was that um, the number it had in the second act, the we are the UFO number, where it just came down all of a sudden, and then you know the dancers were on it and they were off it, and it was lifting up with the dancers on. It was, mm -hmm. it was, it must, it was just, it was stunning. Well, it was visually stunning, that's for sure, um, and. Uh, it was worth the price of admission just to see the technology. But we got through two weeks of tech rehearsal, going scene by scene, and we could never, I could never get it technically worked out enough to go straight through without stopping between each scene. Because the, the way because of the way the set moved, we had 35 hydraulic lifts in the theater. Wow. And we had our own, uh, we had our own electric plant in the basement. They had to put a booster electric plant in the basement of the theater in order to um, get enough electricity to run the show. Couldn't get enough from the outside. Um, and I mean, there were so many things that I could go into about it, but I, I I'll just say that we. Um, like we had three characters on cherry pickers and they were all velcroed and twinkle lighted and so on so you couldn't see the over oh, three judges the three the judges were, weren't they the all, three they judges had... of the high court of the universe right um the the plot was that uh, there was a rock singer who was as i said kind of like um whoever that was, I said. <laughs> Cliff Richard it was, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But he sang, instead of, oh, oh yes, I was trying to think, yes. The uh, Springs, uh, Springsteen uh, of the time, supposedly. Only in, he sang about um, uh, ban the nukes and save the trees. That was his subject. Mm. And so um, he was doing, it started with him and his three backup ladies uh, doing some of the numbers from his act. I think they did like two and a half. And then, and it was just on a rock stage. And then there was a canopy over that part of the stage. Um, suddenly uh, everything started to go nuts and um, the actors went into the floor and the canopy over the, rock stage they were on became the floor before the saucer came forward and landed on it. And um, <clears throat> that was just part of one little scenic move. And so we were <clears throat> in this tech rehearsal for two weeks and I still couldn't run the show. So I was like running at the walls head first going, how are we gonna make this work? And uh, John Napier, 
the wonderful set designer who did this for with me, um, came over to me and he said, Larry, the cast needs a day off anyway, and you could then take them into a rehearsal studio and do the cuts and, you know, work on the stuff you want to work and just give me three days and I'll have this working, I promise you. And I said, oh, John, if that could only be true, thank you. So we came back in three days and he had it working. And uh, oh, wow. <laughs> the, the show was so technically dangerous for the actors that they had to run every cue through from the top to the end with no actors prior to the performance to make sure that it was all working. And I talk about an expensive show, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, so many massive set pieces in that show, weren't there? That don't think people who haven't seen, uh, who didn't see the show don't realize just how huge a show it really, really was. You know, you, you, you know, just to give an example of you in, in say like um, in Cats, you had like the UFO, the one UFO that kind of moved up and down at the beginning and, you know, in time that I think there was, was there, about, I think there were about six of them, weren't they? And they moved, didn't only just move up and down, they kind of moved in all kind of different directions, didn't they as well, the, the, the lighting rig. Hey, John, um, did you see the comment from Jim in our uh, chat? He said the saucer was held up by bolting it to the building next door to the theater. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's insane. You gotta remember they had to go through the wall and get, uh, <laughs> the back wall of the theater and uh, secure it outside because there, the wall of the back wall of the theater wasn't strong enough to take the weight. Anyway. It was a huge and set. And it was a massive show, wasn't it? That, it is, was, that is crazy. It that is, is crazy. <laughs> it, would, it, probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't happen these days. <laughs> um, well, does anybody else have any... I have, I have a couple of little, a couple of little quickie things. One okay. is I have a message for Larry from a gentleman named Matthew Ryan, who is a director in the West End, and he had to cancel at the last minute because he is currently directing My Night with Reg at the Turbine Theater. But he wanted me specifically to tell you that he's such a fan and that your work was so inspirational to him that he really had hoped to be here. So he said you rubbed off on a young, oh, a young kid. Nice. <laughs> that's nice. And now that's very nice. In the I West hope he has a very successful show. We'll let him know. We'll let him know. I just, I really wanted to relay that. And then also, Diane had a quick question about the TV show Smash. Did you want to ask Diane or do you want me to do it? I'm asking. Hi, Larry. Um, hi. I just, um, hi. Um, so the hit musical, um, the TV show Smash references Marilyn the musical in the West End. And I wondered whether they reached out to you. The whole show was about Marilyn. I just wondered whether they reached out to you. No, <laughs> not at all. No, that was a whole different concept. Yeah. Anyway, I remember I saw most all of the, I think I did see every single uh, episode. Yeah, it was fabulous. It was interesting, but sometimes ridiculous. Anyway. <laughs> And then I think we had a question from Jeff, uh, our fellow admin, about Brigadoon. Brigadoon is well, going I back. We did that more, uh, early on, maybe City Sitter or somewhere, but then I saw a reference that you were involved in the TV production with Goulet. Is that true or not? Yes, it's true. Okay, so uh, that was Peter Gennaro? Peter Gennaro was the choreographer and I was his assistant. And what, um, was that an what, Jeffrey, what? Was that an adaptation from DeMille's choreography? Completely new. No, no, completely new, completely okay. different. And, and Peter, I, I thought, you know, I loved Peter and I loved his work, um, but he wasn't exactly the choreographer you would think of for Brigadoon. Um, no. <laughs> however, he, he pulled it off quite well. I mean, we had, uh, um, God, what was his name? Um, Villela? Anyway, we had a very, hmm? Edward Villela. We had a very, thank you. Edward Villela was playing uh, Harry Beaton. And 
he had the, of course, the sword dance to do and uh, the wedding dance and so on. Um, and Peter wasn't really um, into classical ballet. So um, I would work with uh, Edward and say, well, what do you want to do here? And I'd kind of help him um, take what he felt he wanted to do and put it together. Uh, and, uh, and then we'd show it to Peter and he would say yes or no. Um, and that's how we handled, handled it with uh, Edward Villela. So, but the other stuff, uh, Peter did all, all that. And Peter was Hello. in the side, right? Back at, at the beginning? Peter was the choreographer for the sharks. He did okay. the shark mambo and America. Okay. And um, as Cheetah Rivera likes to bring up all the time, did not get the credit he deserved from Jerry because Jerry never really acknowledged him for the work he did in that show. And uh, actually the final audition that I did for West Side Story for the Jet Swing, which was like three days after it had opened on Broadway, um, I, um, I was being helped in the wings between doing the combination in front of Jerry by Peter, who happened to be there helping out, and he he'd get he come say, come, come, come on over here. I want to show you something. You know, he had that literal lateral lisp. And he he helped me with the style in the wings. And then you know what I sang for my audition for West Side Story? It was a song that Judy Garland sang in A Star is Born, but it had been cut from the film. And it was, go lose that long face, that long face, go out. I mean, how can you sing that song for West Side Story audition? But I got it. I don't know how. <laughs> Oh, anyway. that's fun. That's fantastic. I was just wondering, does, does anybody else have any other questions for Larry or any memories they'd like to share with him um, of working with him at all? If anybody, does anybody want to speak? Oh. Going once, going well, you can say something. Well, I have another question. In one of the other Zooms, um, a lot of the cast members talked about your clumps. And I noticed that yes. the, some of the, um, well, I see it in Sweeney, I see it in Evita, I see it in 20th century, how you move the groups. And it's a very dimensional staging, which I don't see a lot anymore. It all seems almost like aerobic dancing at this point when I see Broadway choreography, and I hate it, quite honestly. Well, yes, um, I do. I know in um, What's Good Way in Osiris, we say, okay, take it from the first clump or take it from the third clump or take it from, because of clumps of people at certain points. Uh, and I, I'm not, I don't know exactly why I do that, but I, I find that in doing it, it gives a, a little bit more power to the moment of what you're trying to say, as opposed to having people strung out all over the stage. Um, and, uh, I mean, God knows Fosse used it, and not as much as I do. And, um, and Graziella Danielle, she used it in the opening of uh, Ragtime. She had mm -hmm. different groups of people like the aristocrats and the military. <clears throat> and people said to me at that point, you know, she's ripping you off. And I said, no, she's not. She's doing an appropriate concept for what she's trying to say in the staging. It's just right for it. It's not, she's not copying me. Anyway. I have a question. Oh, Jackie, yeah. go on. Um, it's a little bit of a silly question really, but she, so anyone who knows me knows that Evita is my favorite musical of all time. And I think that your choreography in it is unmatched by anything that I've ever seen, especially Buenos Aires, that number just, blows my mind every time I see it. Did you ever look at it at, from the audience and say, man, that's so good. I wish I was dancing in that number. <laughs> I did. 
I did. I wanted to dance in that number, Jackie, but they just wouldn't let me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have that the legs for it. That would have been a bit strange to have McGowdy <laughs> or Shay just all of a sudden turn well, up. Well, as Larry number. knows, I'm one of the unsung heroes of the Corrie. You tried to train me to dance, Larry, and it just it didn't work. You know, I would have been to dancing. <laughs> <laughs> what you know, the, a, a wrestler would have been to uh, you know Shakespeare. It just it just wouldn't have worked. But like, I just wanted to say, I'm just going to jump in very quickly and say I, I was at the opening night of, of Marilyn, and we talked about eras and how times and 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 various fashions come and go. Eighty three Marilyn, wow. Um, and that year there were so many musicals came and went and were savaged, savaged by the crits and. Uh, I remember because I knew people very well uh, that were involved with the hope with Stephanie, and um, I remember somebody telling me that she actually they actually shipped in one of Marilyn Monroe's dresses uh, from Los Angeles, and she literally stepped into it, and she could actually wear the dress. She actually just they didn't need to alter it. She literally took it on. So when you said that she um, channeled that character. Obviously, I worked with her in Vita, so I knew she was a professional. But she, I remember sitting there, the one thing I said to people, I said, this is Stephanie's role. This is absolutely her. This is, she's, she's brought it. And there was one song called Can You Hear Me Mama? I actually was sitting in the audience going, this is absolutely an amazing piece of theatre that she's channeling Marilyn, this character, this childhood, Marilyn Monroe. Again, the unsung hero of these things, but I remember sitting there and watching that and going, this is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And, and Stephanie brought that, she brought that. Time? <laughs> <laughs> not, not Cliff. You were you had to deal. You had to deal with the whole Cliff thing. I, we, you know, everybody knew that. Everybody sitting in the audience was going, Cliff is is the Peter Pan of pop, and um, uh, the whole thing of bringing a, a character to this, it, it was it was great because Cliff's a very nice person. I mean, he's a lovely guy, but in terms of of bringing that character to a show it, it just I, I i respect you manfully for trying to bring that and follow him around the stage and go try thinking about this try thinking about that it was it was uh it was a curious piece. but that year 83 was such an interesting curious melange of of musicals some some great successes blood brothers and stuff like that um, and then there was um, uh, other stuff that uh, slips <laughs> slips the mind. Um, but you know, Mark, Blood Brothers, the original Blood Brothers in 83 only ran for six months. Oh, well, look at Sweeney Todd, which is probably yeah. my favourite musical of all time. Uh, as we talked about in one of the previous chats, absolutely got bashed sideways. Oh. Little Shop of Horrors was in 83, Blondell. Blondell, there you go. Um, no. But there you go. Larry, just wanted to say thank you again for coming in doing this and, uh, and chatting with folks. You're, you're a legend in the business and an inspiration to anybody that um, wants to tread those boards and, and, and take their, you know, grab their courage and step out and throw themselves into that machine. Because the machine will eat you. The machine will eat you if you don't bring it and, and you bring it. Well, thank you, but it oh, doesn't, you, it man. still eats you sometimes. <laughs> uh, speaking of Sweeney Todd, when we were, when I was told we were going to do Sweeney in London at the Royal Drury Lane Haunted Theatre, I thought, wow, this is its home. This is where it belongs. They're going to, it's just going to play like mad there. And of course, what happened was the critics just tore it apart. Um, and they accused Hal of stealing from Nicholas Nickleby, except that whoever that critic was had, didn't do any uh, his, his kind of uh, research, as I guess is the word, because Nicholas Nickleby opened after Sweeney Todd did. Um, anyway, it wasn't until they did it at the National that it 
was acclaimed uh, a great musical. I think it's yeah. Steve's masterpiece myself. Yeah. Brilliant and, piece of work. Wow. Okay. I will tell you, as, as we wrap up, I must tell you, my mother uh, dragged me when I was, I believe, 11 years old to see a preview of Sweeney Todd in New York. We were visiting from California and she said, you'll thank me later, which of course I did. But she literally said, you're going to come if I have to break every bone in your body, you need to see this, come. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm very grateful that she did because I, I managed to miss plenty of other you know, fabulous things, including uh, Evita on Broadway. But uh, thanks, mom. <laughs> uh, Lori, thank you so much for being with us and thank everybody for being with us. This has been such a fantastic discussion. I think maybe my favorite of all. Uh, and we just, we can't tell you, Larry, how grateful we are just that you share your time oh, and your yeah. memories with us. I'm grateful too, thank you. It's, been, so it, it's been truly wonderful. And, and thank you to our audience out there who are still with us. I know some people had to, had to leave early, um, but um, thank you very much for, for being patient with us and joining us. And, and um, Larry, thank you from the bottom of our, all of our hearts. Thank you for sharing your your, your life you. story with you I enjoy with sharing <laughs> and i bless you this is recorded for posterity so if you all take a look at our channel on youtube we'll we'll send out the info uh yeah. but but it'll be out there for you guys to to look back on and we're so happy to preserve some of these stories all righty everybody okay. be safe and be careful wear a mask all that good stuff thank you bye. thank you bye bye, 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 bye now take care <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. As usual, I never know how to get it.